Hello and welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. This is a podcast about better understanding other people and better understanding ourselves. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. If you appreciate this podcast, you can show your support by signing up on my site for a paid premium subscription. On this episode, I talk to orchestra conductor Ming Luke. Most of our talk is focused on how he uses body language to communicate with the orchestra. I also ask him about how he views the role and responsibilities of a conductor. I ask him about the anxiety that he had early on in his career when he was still unsure what kinds of mistakes he might make. I ask him about the leadership and managerial skills that good conducting requires. I ask him if he's ever done something accidental with his hand gestures when conducting that changed the course of a performance. You can learn more about Ming's experience on his website, which is mingluke.com. That's M-I-N-G-L-U-K-E dot com. As I do this episode in early October, he's getting ready to conduct the Las Cruces Symphony in New Mexico in late October. And then after that, he's on to California for a music festival there. I'll read a little bit from his website. Ming Luke is a versatile conductor that has excited audiences around the world in performances of both symphonic and theatrical works. Highlights include conducting the Bolshoi Orchestra in Moscow, performances of Romeo and Juliet and Cinderella at the Kennedy Center, his English debut at Sadler's Wells with Birmingham Royal, conducting Dvorak's Requiem in Dvorak Hall in Prague, recording scores for a Coppola film, multiple Asian cultural programs with the San Francisco Symphony, and over 150 performances at the San Francisco War Memorial with San Francisco Ballet. Longtime critic Alan Ulrich of the San Francisco Chronicle said, Ming Luke delivered the best live theater performance I've ever heard of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. And in 2016, Luke's War Requiem was named Best Choral Performance of 2016 in the San Francisco Bay Area. For this episode, I want to thank Molly Shackery, who's been helping me with the podcast and who helped brainstorm some questions for this episode. I also want to thank behavior specialist Alan Crowley, who recommended I interview an orchestra conductor. Okay, here's the talk with Ming Luke. Hi, Ming. Thanks for coming on the show. Happy to be here. Yeah, so maybe we can start with uh, one common question I've seen asked about conducting is people who are curious just what exactly a conductor does. For example, one form of this question can be what happens if they're isn't a conductor? What happens with the band? Do, are they able to play? How, how do they perform? And maybe you could talk a little bit about how you view the role of a conductor and the and the value and benefit that they bring to the table. Sure. Yeah. A few hundred years ago, there actually weren't conductors for ensembles. Uh, oftentimes, the concertmaster, that is the lead violinist, would actually be gesturing uh, with his body with his or her body um, to keep the ensemble together. But as ensembles got larger and larger, the necessity to have um, somebody coalesce and unify the artistic vision of the ensemble uh, was needed. Now, there are certainly many groups now that uh, are conductorless. Orpheus Chamber Orchestra is a very famous one. Um, But the amount of time that it takes to rehearse and um, really get everybody on the same page artistically can make it prohibitive, especially uh, since you know time is um, can be very expensive. Um, so conductors, you know, it's it's true. The the musicians have the music in front of them. Uh, they don't necessarily need the conductor to know when to play. It's really how to play. And so let's say the music is getting louder. We have a crescendo. It is uh, difficult for everybody to really lock in to know how to do that at the same time because you can increase your volume in a lot of different ways, um, you know, quickly at the beginning or very slow and steady or very quickly at the end. And a conductor's job is really to unify that artistic vision. For me, a uh, conductor's goal is to allow the musicians to play at their best, no matter what the circumstances are. And so sometimes that's very practical. If it's a very large orchestra, you might need to keep everybody together that, you know, 50 feet apart on stage. Um, how can they play together if it's very hard to hear from one side of the stage to the next? Uh, sometimes it's very musical, like we were just mentioning. Uh, if it's the idea of how a musical phrase is shaped, um, what uh, a slowdown, a ritardando might look like so that everybody stays together. 
Um, so my role as a conductor is really to try to unify the artistic vision, uh, no matter the size of the ensemble, and of course, help the musicians play their best, depending on the circumstances. And as I understand it, the at least some conductors, their role is also to interpret the music. Is is that correct? And is that is that always the case? Is it, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that the pre-performance and, and rehearsal part of it works? Sure. Yeah, there are many uh, musicians, uh, conductors that are actually very famous for the amount of knowledge that they bring and their physical gestures might not actually be as precise or as clear as some others, but their musical vision is really important. And so that's part of the idea of, of trying to get everybody on one unified artistic vision. Because if you have a, an ensemble like the Orpheus Chamber Ensemble, everybody in that group, let's say it's 40 people, might have an opinion mm. on on how the music is approached. And so for conductors, it's very easy to say, hey, let's do this version of this. And so for instance, um, this week I'm working on Prokofiev of Romeo and Juliet, uh, which is a very famous piece, but the tempi can widely vary from conductor to conductor. And it's just much more efficient to have uh, one musical vision to approach the work rather than having an entire discussion uh, throughout the work. And as mentioned before, there are certainly ensembles that actually spend the time to do that. And it can be very gratifying as a musician, as an instrumentalist, to play in a group where everybody's uh, artistic ideas are sort of incorporated. But it is very impractical, uh, especially because most professional orchestras will put together the music only in one week. And so they really have just four or five rehearsals, two and a half hour rehearsals uh, to try to get a piece uh, presentable for the public. It kind of reminds me of uh, some jobs I've worked that were less hierarchical than others, you know, where it wasn't clear who called the shots or, or who made the calls. And there's something that can be nice about that, but it also means there can be a lot of confusion about like, how did things exactly get decided? So is that an accurate analogy for, for what the conductor does? Yes, decision by committee is always very, very messy. Now, in the past, you know, the generations beforehand, the conductor was a bit of a tyrant, and um, that has changed quite a bit in the last uh, few decades, where the conductor and the musicians are more collaborative. And it's, uh, I think, a better circumstance now, because again, we do want to unify the artistic idea of an approach to the work, but we're not doing it in a way that, um, that nullifies the musician's input and participation. How would you describe, uh, when it comes to the movements that you make during conducting, how would you describe the various pieces of information that are being communicated when you conduct? Sure. There is the practical and there's artistic. And so traditionally, and many people uh, deviate from this, but traditionally the right hand with the baton is more of a timekeeper. And music is, uh, as many people know, is organized into various measures and have time signatures. And to the right hand will mimic those time signatures. And if a, a measure has three quarter notes in a bar, then the conductor will oftentimes have three gestures that represent each of those beats. The left hand oftentimes is considered to be the artistic side and it shows dynamics, shows entrances, and is much more fluid and is not tied down to the rhythmic integrity of the work. Um, again, this is very, um, very flexible. There are many conductors, for instance, that conduct actually with a baton in their left hand and their left hand is the timekeeper. And there are many conductors where uh, the ensemble might not need the time uh, dictation as much and actually just need more of the phrasing and you might actually stop beating the actual beats in the bar but traditionally that is the case where the right hand generally keeps time along with the structure of the music and left hand can be a little bit more free when you say the you know say say he's doing with the the right hand the the three beats let's say it's three four so he's making like three strokes in the air next to each other to give a sense of the spatial Thing? Is, it, is that accurate? 
Yes, yes. And so it would uh, very much traditionally look like a triangle. You would go as your downbeat, your first beat would go down, then you go to the right, and then you go up. And so mm. you create a little bit of a triangle. And again, the shape of a triangle can vastly differ. So if it's something, music that's very loud and you want to show a very large gesture to encourage the orchestra to play loud, you can make the triangle quite large. Or very much the opposite, if you want to make it very soft, you could, that triangle could be very soft. Mm. If it could be more lyrical, then maybe it's a triangle that's very flat and side to side versus music that is a little bit march-like um, or a little bit more um, accented than your gestures and your triangles might be a little bit more vertical. Um, there's a lot of variation to the shape and to the gestures, but uh, the right hand, or at least the hand that is keeping time, will try to maintain that, that structure of a triangle of some sort in something that's three. Now, that, again, that changes quite a bit because, you know, you can emphasize certain beats more or less, but in the very beginning of conducting, we're always taught about the conducting patterns for the various time signatures so that the orchestra knows exactly where they're supposed to be. When you talk about the the right hand keeping time and the left hand doing more artistic or dynamic or uh, ups and downs and entrances, is it difficult to, um, to keep those together? I mean, I, I play some piano and I've always struggled with the you know, doing rhythm with the left hand and, and doing melody with the right and, and trying to, you know, keep a steady rhythm while you do more um, melody type things. Is there a similar difficulty there of having to get good at, at basically keeping time and doing the, the more artistic stuff? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. It very much requires a lot of coordination. It's like tapping your head and rubbing your belly at the same time, trying to divorce um, mirroring. We actually, uh, with conducting students, um, they may start off with mirroring just to get an idea of patterns, but then we have to break. Um, it's very much a goal to be able to be very independent between the two hands mm. so that the amount of information can be, um, uh, more information can be portrayed. Mm -hmm. It seems like piano is is a really good practice for that instrument wise. Is that is that accurate to say, or are there other instruments that are good for that? Oh yeah, definitely piano. Definitely, um, I would say organ too, because you have to use your feet. But conductors are not supposed to move their feet as much. But anything that requires um, really divorcing uh, the gestures from uh, from hemisphere to hemisphere is is helpful. Yeah, that was that's really what I struggled with, with a lot. It's a, it's a difficult task. Uh, and you you play piano, right? I play piano. I play violin very poorly. Um, a stereotype with conductors is that you need to play all instruments, but that's actually not true. It's more important to know how the instruments work and obviously um, um, have an idea of, of what is important information. So there are certain gestures that you give to string players that you should not give to brass players. And there are certain mm -hmm. gestures that you give to wind players that you don't give to, for instance, singers. And so, um, again, it's about knowing the instruments as much as possible, how they work. But having to directly play them is just a stereotype. We don't, we don't necessarily need to know how to play all the instruments. You talked a little bit about the, the right hand and the left hand. Do you use much in the way of facial expressions when you conduct? Uh, yeah, that's definitely um, that's definitely an aspect. There's actually a very famous uh, video on YouTube uh, pe where people can find where Leonard Bernstein is conducting the Vienna Philharmonic only using his face. And it's uh, a work of Haydn. Um, and uh, Haydn doesn't necessarily, that was back in the era where you could have, the ensembles were smaller that you really didn't necessarily need a conductor. Um, but he is really portraying the character of the music. And so that's part of our job is really to sort of portray how the music is going to be performed. And part of that, the characterization is also using your face and, you know, your, your arms, your hands and your entire uh, upper body as well to try to portray uh, the characteristics of the music. So for instance, if the music is loud, is it, is it warm and burnished or is it angry? Is it, is it sort of uh, brilliant or is it sort of understated, but just full, you know, those are all very, very different characteristics and your arms, your face, everything goes together to try to portray how that music is different from one another. And how would you, uh, how would you describe how you do that with your face? Is it, is it just, your interpretation of the the mood of the music and, and kind of matching your facial expression to it a bit? Yeah, to some extent. You know, it can be a little bit distracting if you're, you know, if it's like 
a death portrayed in the music and you're crying. I mean, like that would be a little bit, um, I think, a distraction to the musicians. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, there is a, certainly a way of encouraging players because they are people that are playing those instruments. And so, you know, uh, giving them a very strong entrance and, you know, encouragement uh, with your face as well is going to help them play louder. Um, there's this one section in uh, Prokofiev, Romeo and Juliet, which is what I'm doing with uh, an orchestra this week, where it the music is is like chopping it's like almost like the string sound from psycho you know and they're playing it very pleasantly and and just sort of light and i made a gesture where i actually turned the baton almost like i was holding a knife in my hand and i was like saying you know and, um, showing them quite a, aggressive motions and they just you know th- without saying a word you know they instantly change the way they're playing but you know i wouldn't do that during a concert but during a rehearsal is very easy way to to instantly change uh the approach to the music and I imagine too, with the you're probably also using your your body, like your you know how far up and down you you move your body, your your back and your neck and stuff to communicate an extra dramatic part, things like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there is a, um, Alondra de la Parra, I think maybe in in, in um, I was conducting in France. I think it's her. I, I forget actually who was conducting, but there's this famous part where the music got really soft and she almost ducked behind the podium, um, and it was famous Beethoven. Um, uh, was uh, one of the first conductors too. I mean, uh, technically, one of the first conductor was Lully, uh, Jean Baptiste Lully, the French uh, court composer. But Beethoven, when he was conducting, would jump up and down on the podium if he wanted the music to be loud, and again, uh, would hide behind the podium if it wanted to be soft. Now, we don't take things to that extreme nowadays because uh, it's a little bit, um, again, visually distracting, and um, you don't want to sort of distract from the music. There are plenty of ways to get the orchestra to play loud. Um, but it really depends on the person because there are plenty of conductors that can get the orchestra to play incredibly loud and they don't need to gesticulate in a way that looks ridiculous. Um, I think it just depends on their connection to the orchestra and um, the orchestra themselves. You, know? you said that uh, there were some different signals between like signals you'd give to brass that you wouldn't give to wind and, and signals to singers and such. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, say we're talking between brass and wind, what are, what are some different signals in that area? Sure. And so strings have this ability to really sneak in. And because there are so many, let's say there can be 30 violins in an orchestra, they can really sneak in. So their entrance isn't as rhythmically precise Mm. and it can create some really beautiful sounds. Winds and brass, however, it's very hard to sneak in. So you can play with very little what we call a tack, like the initial start of the the, um, note, but they really have a, they're either playing or they're not. And so wind players oftentimes, wind and brass players often uh, really value conductors that can be very clear so that when they enter, they know that, uh, let's say the 10 of them, if it's all winds and brass, um, like 10, 15 people, they're all coming in exactly at the same time and they don't have to worry about trying to really lock into each other. String players oftentimes really want to know how to play in terms of how loud to get, how soft to get, and they want to see much more of the artistic side because, again, they can kind of sneak in, they can stay together as an ensemble very easily because they're all playing the same music. You know, the first violins are all playing, let's say they're 16 first violins, they're all literally playing the same music most of the time. And so their goal is they, they can stay together, they just really need to know how to play and and how to make 16 people that are playing the same thing shape the music in the same way. And so some of the gestures are very, um, it can be very different because you serve practical or artistic value. Mm -hmm. Uh, One typical thing for brass players, you can show like a closed fist or, you know, a claw, uh, you know, a hand that shows a lot of intensity. But for singers, if you did that with a tension, it would actually, uh, they would mimic that in their throat and it would make their throat all tense. And so it's very different sound um, that you can do with brass players, but you shouldn't do with singers. And that's a very clear example that we tell conductors at the beginning. When it comes to eye contact, like who you look at in the orchestra, is that largely about cueing who's going to play? Or are there other uses of it? Like, for example, maybe looking at someone uh, when they, you know, when they did something wrong. Can you talk a little bit about how eye contact and eye direction play into it? 
Sure. Yeah. Eye contact and your position of your body. So if you glance over to somebody, obviously that is an opportunity to show and communicate with them. And then if you turn your entire body and look at them, obviously it's a much stronger um, direct sense of communication. And so it's actually very um, sensitive to when musicians make mistakes um, because it happens all the time. Sometimes they flub an entrance, sometimes, you know, sometimes conductors make mistakes. But regardless, um, you have a split second decision whether that's something that needs to be addressed or not. If it's something that seems like it is a wrong note, then looking over would be a way of connecting and saying, hey, you know what, I don't know if that's that, this is that's not correct. Let's let's try to fix that. Or if it's that they just miss a note and it, they'll fix it the next time, then bringing a lot of attention to that might actually be counterproductive and make it more difficult for them in the future. They might nervously think, oh, oh my goodness, I hope I don't make this mistake again or else, you know, the orchestra uh, will be and the conductor will be mad at me. Um, but in general, looking and the way you use your body is very um, to show and communicate is pretty important. So oftentimes for cues or if more importantly, let's say that the entire orchestra is playing, but the oboes have the melody, you know, giving all your attention and your body and your eyes to the oboes allows the rest of the orchestra to say, hey, okay, the oboes must be the most important. Um, mm. And immediately it helps balance to say, okay, I'm going to pull back a little bit, listen to the oboe and accompany mm. the oboe as a player. And uh, likewise, you know, um, there is this, when I was young, I saw Wolfgang Savalish, who was the conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And we were, I was in the chorus where he was um, conducting Elijah, which is a fantastic oratorio by Mendelssohn. And there's this one little gesture that the trumpets go, ta, 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 ta. And the very first time they played it, you know, they repeated several times. He gave them a very clear clue, showed them exactly how to play with a little bit of separation and uh, rhythmic integrity. And then the next time it came through, he just glanced over very quickly, gave them a smaller cue. And the third time, he didn't even cue them. He just kind of looked at them for a second then turned away. And they just knew immediately, oh, okay, this is going to be very similar. And I was, it was something that stuck with me a lot because it was rehearsing without having to stop or say a single word. And that sort of uh, pragmatic uh, um, efficiency is something that orchestras really, really appreciate. So is it, uh, is it the case that I understand that some works – are much more uh, dictated by the, you know, the composer and, and other works are more open to interpretation. And uh, is it fair to say that for the works that are more open to interpretation, the conductors have more room to do different things with the work and maybe bring out a, a sound over here that a different conductor would, would do something different on? Is that all accurate to say? Yeah, there's a lot of... Um... There's a lot of play between um, what is considered appropriate for the conductor's uh, in artistic interpretation to really uh, dictate. And so, for instance, um, you know, Bernstein was really famous for his Stravinsky um, and Mahler. Mahler really uh, expected that the conductor would have a viewpoint. And mm. it's very famous that uh, worldwide, when you hear Mahler symphonies, you know, the most important next question is who is conducting mm. and so michael tilson thomas's mahler who's also famous for mahler uh is going to be very different than bernstein and people will have large debates on which they think really uh brings out the best in mahler or is a great interpretation um stravinsky can be very uh he had a very clear neoclassical phase which is you know very highly structured and very austere and some people tend to uh, approach Stravinsky's works and say, hey, I really want to maintain the integrity of what Stravinsky wrote. But one of my favorite things about Bernstein is that he did the exact opposite. He said, I'm going to insert my artistic voice on top of this. And yes, it is a very clean structure that is very much built on uh, ratios and uh, uh, classical ideas, but I'm still going to have my viewpoint. And as a result, a lot of his uh, interpretations of Stravinsky are really thrilling and engaging in a way that others uh, sort of shy away from. For those composers that, like Mahler, where there's more left to interpretation, is it that those, con those composers just philosophically believe that 
conductors or, or, or orchestras should interpret it in different ways? Or sometimes is it just a lack of them being explicit for whatever reason? Yeah, I think it depends on the era. I mean, when you get to what we call the Romantic era, um, which is about expression and uh, individual individual sort of ideas, um, a lot of that repertoire um, uh, where Mahler comes from, he's like late Romantic, that it was expected that the conductor would have an equal voice part as well. And mm-hmm. so, you know, um, oftentimes, for instance, uh, the music of Liszt, but the great pianist Liszt, when you have pianists play it and they play every single note perfectly and everything is clean and very technical, it can actually be very unengaging. I mean, like it's brilliant and and exciting to have such technical prowess, but if you don't have an artistic viewpoint, then the music falls a little flat. And so mm. for music of Liszt, you really need to bring um, an idea of what the music is supposed to be about. And then, you know, there are certain, you know, composers in the classical era, and then we're talking about early Beethoven or Haydn and Mozart, where there is sort of um, a narrower window of interpretations. It can still be quite large, but the sort of differences can be a little bit more uh, reduced compared to the Romantic era where you'll have wide swings of your interpretations. Right. And then before that, yeah, before that in the Baroque era with Bach, you know, there was actually very little written into the music. And so the interpretation can actually be quite severe. Again, there's this very famous uh, Chaconne um, that is done um, uh, in ballet, but it was done in the 70s. Uh, it was set in the 70s by Balanchine in New York City Ballet using this uh, Baroque music, this Chaconne. And the interpretations that people took towards Baroque music in the 70s is nothing like we do nowadays. And so when that ballet is performed, the music sounds a little bit archaic because it is a very clearly 70s approach to uh, Baroque music, very heavy and slow and ponderous. Mm. And nowadays, uh, Baroque music, uh, um, there's a, uh, a movement to try to match the performing styles of, of its actual, of the Baroque era. And that can be oftentimes much quicker and uh, lighter. Hmm. So it can be, yeah, it, interpretation is dependent on many, many different factors. But yes, conductors oftentimes have very different uh, viewpoints and uh, advocate for different things, even in their own lifetime. You know, Glenn Gould playing Bach, there's famous recordings of his, uh, um, uh, 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 I forget what work is it? Is it the um, Goldberg variations uh, from, you know, uh, the 50s and the 80s? And he has two completely different versions of it. And so they couldn't be more different. And it's just because his viewpoints changed or maybe he was just feeling different on the day that he recorded it. So uh, with the amount that um, different conductors can vary in how they conduct their different body languages and approaches, does that mean there's a adjustment period required when conductors start working with an orchestra? Is that is that right? Yeah, it can be. I mean, nowadays, um, conductors that can connect with uh, the players instantly is uh, um, very much prized because orchestras, professional orchestras, really need to put together music very quickly. And there are oftentimes um, uh, performances and shows that you put together with little or no rehearsal. Uh, There are several different nutcracker performances where there is no rehearsal. The orchestra Mm. just shows up and actually plays. And it's like uh, uh, almost a performance on the first time. And so if you don't have the, um, the technical skill to be as clear as possible for the orchestra, then, um, then you probably won't get hired back. Mm. And, you know, right now uh, a big trend is accompanying uh, film with a live orchestra. And the musicians are all given headsets that have a click track that tells them exactly when to play, but you still need a conductor to sort of unify everything. And that can be a very difficult experience because you need a conductor that is very, very clear and precise. Mm -hmm. And so likewise, it doesn't allow time for the players to really sort of have to learn how to interpret a conductor. But there are many conductors. I mean, Kim Rizor, uh, music director, uh, former music director of the New York Philharmonic, and he was also a conductor of the Gewandhaus Orchestra. Uh, he was partially crippled, and yet he was one of the most brilliant conductors uh, of all time of history. Um, and to, despite his physical limitations, he was still able to portray the music and lead the orchestra in really engaging and insightful ways. How have your Uh, body language and movements when conducting changed over the years, if they have? 
Yeah, I mean, I think one of the hardest things for conductors when they're starting out to know is how much is needed from the conductor and how much the orchestra will do by themselves. A typical trick that we'll do in conducting workshops with uh, young conductors is to have the orchestra play completely by themselves and say, you know, they're playing all of this. What are you going to add to it? Mm -hmm. And knowing that an orchestra can actually be... um, worse off with a bad conductor in front of them. You know, let's say they can play 85% as well um, of a piece. A conductor can add to that or it can it can take away from that. And so if you have a bad conductor that's actually hindering the musicality of the orchestra, then obviously that's not a very good conductor. Mm-hmm. But if you have a conductor that can take what the orchestra is naturally going to do and um, uh, bring it to a higher level, then that's obviously um, uh, an ideal. So maybe that's a good segue into... The question of does it happen that a conductor and the players can have a a bad relationship uh and if that happens what are some of the ways that that can play out in a, in a musical sense yeah i mean it's all about trust and you can lose the trust of an orchestra instantly um you know the it's a big responsibility to be on the podium and have the audacity to tell musicians like this is my viewpoint and i i i believe in this viewpoint let's say if i was going to conduct um um new york philharmonic or um uh and i'm going to be doing a brahms symphony well they've done brahms with with kurt mazur they've done brahms with alan gilbert they've done brahms with uh bernstein and many many co- uh, uh, great conductors like who who am i to uh, um, insert my particular view- viewpoint. And mm-hmm. so, you know, building that trust and uh, trying to maintain that trust is actually very important. There was actually this one great article that I was reading um, about New York Times, and there's this young conductor, 27 year old, really great phenom. And this fl- a flautist, a flute player, asked them, Hey, would you, do you want me to play it like this or like this? And the conductor said, Oh, you know what? Uh, that's a good question. Do it the way, the second way you said. And the fl- flautist shot back and said, "Well, I didn't play it that way the first time. Were you not listening to me?" Right? Um, and very, very provocative. But the thing that um, you know, in that situation, some conductors might get offended, or they might, you know, shrink away. But he just kind of laughed it away. So yeah, I wasn't listening to that point. But you know, playing it the second way is great. You know, and immediately diffused all tension in the room, and they just got back to work, which is what everybody wants to do. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, there's plenty of times, actually, if you go online, you can actually see Bernstein uh, speaking with uh, orchestra members, and they talk back to him. And, you know, they have these discussions and it can get a little tense. Um, but, you know, I think that the motivation for everybody is that they want to play their best, they want to be proud of the the work that they're doing all together. And so, you know, the conductor has a pretty big responsibility there and uh, the trust needed is pretty important. Um, There are many situations where there are colleagues that don't like working together and they need to. Um, There's a very famous one, I probably shouldn't name the orchestra, but it is pretty famous if you look it up, where the wind players were very, very upset with one of their colleagues and yet they had to play together for years and there was lawsuits about it. (laughs) Um, there are conductors that are very much not respected in the industry, but, you know, still, uh, conduct quite a bit. And again, it's part of a point of pride of the musicians. They still want to sound good. So they're going to try to do as much as they can to, uh, put on a good show and might have to work in other ways, um, to make sure that the performances don't get derailed. There's actually a really wonderful example, uh, recently, of a colleague of mine, Noah Lindquist, who is a phenomenal musician, pianist, and he was an assistant conductor for um, an opera and had to be thrown into the conductor's seat very last minute. He is a, a fantastic musician, but didn't have as much experience with an orchestra. But the orchestra really loved his musicianship, and they said, look, we're going to stay together, we're going to work hard, we're going to do this all together, and you show us what the music's supposed to be and the timing to connect with the singers. We'll keep ourselves together, we'll get through this together. And it was a fantastic experience where everybody was really excited and happy. It was a brilliant performance. The orchestra and musicians played well. Noah uh, conducted and portrayed the music beautifully. And it was a circumstance where they really actually all trusted each other to try to get together this performance. And it was a wonderful um, situation. I think uh, I think it was in your Reddit thread. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but somebody described a conductor who didn't get along with the orchestra and some players basically they were cued mistakenly by the 
conductor, they basically could have corrected themselves and not made a mistake, but they basically allowed the conductor to cue them to make a mistake as kind of a passive aggressive thing. Yeah. And, and that, that's, <laughs> that's probably like an extreme example, but it just made me think there's probably some, you know, kind of things that can happen like that, that, that just are related to a, a bad relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Very definitively. So I think, um, you know, and then there's obviously respect too. I mean, there's a certain amount of, um, there are orchestra uh, conductors that uh, are greatly respected by the musicians, um, but they might not be as technically gifted and to might make mistakes or, you know, do things that are quote, technically not very uh, um, good as, as, you know, for conducting technique. Um, but the musicians really love them. And so they will do their best to play as much as they can. So for instance, Blumstedt, who used to be the music director for San Francisco uh, Symphony. I mean, I believe he's in his 90s now. He doesn't have the technical uh, facility that he did when he was in his 30s or 40s, you know. And yet the amount of respect that the musicians have for Blumstedt is just absolutely amazing. So when they do do performances, you know, it's a very moving um, experience because they are really you know, connecting and, and trying to work hard to make the performance as engaging as possible. It seems like with the uh, amount of managerial and, and leadership skills that's required to to do the job well, is that something that you go out of your way to train on? Or is that usually something that conductors naturally have and develop on their own, if that makes sense? I think it's both. I think there are people that are naturally gifted at leadership and they're ones that need to learn the techniques. And, you know, there's a reason why sometimes uh, I think um, there is one orchestra conductor that actually leads business classes because, you know, the idea of leadership from the podium is directly related to, you know, management. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'll actually lead sessions where he'll get in the orchestra members' faces like, like a manager that's very micromanaging. <laughs> or um, uh, uh, a conductor who basically doesn't show any leadership whatsoever and sort of like a la lackadaisical manager that doesn't really actually check in with the, play mm -hmm. the players uh, or their, their um, um, uh, workers. And as a result, is a direct symbol of, of you know, what good leadership is. For me personally, I think it was very difficult at the beginning to really understand what the orchestra does by themselves and what I need to bring to it. I think it was very common for uh, young conductors. Um, but later on, I think the next um, big hurdle for me was, again, situational. What do the orchestra members need at this point? What is going to be helpful? And really understanding the nuances of those situations. I remember my first time conducting one of the big, big orchestras. And I was so excited. I was going to make my, you know, like my imprint and really excite people and get them enthusiastic. And a friend of mine was in the orchestra. And beforehand, he's just like, hey, you're coming to this concert. We just had a huge concert. Everybody's super tired. Um, and we have another big uh, recording project that's in a couple of weeks. And so, you know, just, just know going into it that, <laughs> you know, people are going to be pretty tired. And, um, and your if I went to it. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's more that if I came in super gung ho and I was going to like mm, work them to the bone, right. that that was going to be the worst possible thing that I could possibly do, gotcha. you know. Um, and so understanding those circumstances, you know, there are times where the orchestra, especially if you're doing theater like opera or ballet, and you're in the pit, the acoustics are very difficult, and it's not a very um, easy experience for the for the musicians. So sometimes clarity and and precision is really prized to make sure that they feel comfortable. And sometimes in the orchestra, they just want to just feel like we have a good, cohesive idea. And so, I mean, like it really, that idea that every situation is different and you need to approach it in a different manner is something that I'm always, you know, continuing to uh, refine. So when you first started out, was it pretty nerve wracking to conduct? Were you, uh, did you have some maybe exaggerated or um, overstated ideas of, the kinds of harms that you could do if you, you know, mess something up? How, how, how would could you talk a little bit about how that played out? Yeah. I mean, I remember the first time conducting Nutcracker and it was with a uh, San Francisco ballet and San Francisco ballet is the orchestra that uh, did the American premiere of the Nutcracker and actually created the holiday tradition of the Nutcracker uh, in the U S it's actually a very um, historic uh, ensemble. Um, but 
I had never conducted the Nutcracker before, and I was a nervous wreck before that. You know, before the performance, I had uh, and I actually still have this routine. If I if I get very nervous, is um, you know, I try to calm my um, mental activity as well as I calm my physical um, um, uh, activity too. So that's calming my heartbeat, slowing down my breath, taking very deep breaths. And at the time, I wasn't you know uh, meditating as much, but nowadays, um, you know, we know that slowing you know the your breath will help slow down your heart rate and try to slow down my racing mind. Mm -hmm. But it was a nerve wracking experience because I remember all the practice that I did and getting into the pit and the orchestra actually responded differently than I had anticipated. And so in those moments, you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I adjust to this? How do I make it comfortable for them? It was, was, uh, uh, looking back, it's thrilling, but during the moment it was, um, it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. Well, I, and I was reading some, I don't think it was in your thread. I think it was another Reddit thread about, uh, from a different conductor. Uh, and maybe you've seen this post, but it described, uh, the kind of the, the terror, the anxiety that a new conductor had. And it, he described a joke that the, the band played on him where they basically, you know, set him up to think that they were playing something different or, or doing something, uh, wrong based on something he, he did. And he said it filled him with, you know, even though they were joking and he quickly realized that he had this tremendous anxiety thinking that he had screwed something up. It it was in rehearsal, it wasn't in, in, uh, you know, an actual performance, but uh, he kind of got at that amount of uh, responsibility you feel, you know, for for the music, which I can imagine, especially when you start out, you, you, you must be pretty, pretty nerve wracking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is a lot of responsibility and it's sort of like that, uh, um, I actually say about, uh, the presidency, right. They say, you know, the person that you want to run for president is not the person that would run for president. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes a lot of, um, strength to have the audacity to stand in front of the orchestra and to lead, you know, 70 plus musicians, um, some of whom have more experience than you've, you know, like you've been living, you know, mm-hmm. and um, tell them, um, you know, your interpretation of the music. Have you ever noticed something accidental you did uh, body language wise that actually changed a performance? Oh, yeah, of course. And you're like, oh, or you, or you get surprised and say, oh, wow, that actually worked. You know, this was great. <laughs> or you do something. I remember, actually, it was uh, um, another big orchestra. This is a, um, a Houston Symphony. And I was conducting something. And I just, I changed the shape of my hand very very slightly and they instantly changed the color of how they played Hmm. and that's when i realized how subtle and how um uh musical uh these performances can be and it was really a thrilling experience um i remember um you know so many little instances like that um i was conducting uh, san francisco symphony for an online uh performance during pandemic and it was the first time uh, this small group, it was like only eight musicians had gotten together since they had stopped playing because of the pandemic. And just them, feeling them lock into each other and then adjust to each other and all of us sort of collaborating. Like I'll, I'll never forget that. I mean, like that's one of those influential musical moments that just stays with you. You know, it's mm-hmm. very, very um, meaningful. Could you give a little bit more detail about that? You changed the shape of your hand. What was the... Um... What was the, the the detail there? Oh yeah, and so it was my, with my left hand, and you know, if you hold your left hand in a fist, or if you hold your left hand flat, even if you hold your left hand flat and it's palm down versus palm facing up, all those actually will have very subtle, um, or in some cases, very large differences um, mm. to the orchestra. You know, and so whether you are showing something that has intensity, or you have something that has relaxed and is much more flowing, um, those will change how the orchestra musicians can play. And um, with uh, the, the orchestra members that have incredible technical facility, which oftentimes leads to the ability to be much more expressive because you have the technical ability to be, um, have a really wide range of, of colors, you know, little things like that can really um, change a performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like hand up is kind of like swelling upwards and hand down has the sense of suppressing and, and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. For people that don't know much or are not into classical music at all. Is there a specific recommendation you would give for a classical piece that you think is a good, uh, you know, mainstream crossover recommendation? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the funny thing about music is that when we're born, there is no preference, right? Kids will listen to um, uh, Mozart, and they'll listen to Metallica, they'll listen to, you know, Billy Joel, they'll listen to uh, Taylor Swift, you know, there really is very little um, preference. And the thing is that with classical music, I think sometimes there's a perceived idea that you need to appreciate it to understand it. And uh, Stravinsky had this great quote, actually, he said, music appreciation is too much about appreciation, and it should be more about music. <laughs> and so um, the pieces that I tend to gravitate towards are ones that have definitive, uh, what we call programs or an idea behind it. And there are two types of music, absolute music and programmatic music. And absolute music is music for its own sake. It exists just for the sheer beauty or structure. But programmatic music has some idea behind it, like it accompanies a story, it's telling a story, or it portrays an emotion. So for instance, the piece that I'm working on this, um, this week, Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, that's a fantastic work for people to um, listen to. Because when you hear young Juliet, the music for Juliet when she is youthful, and um, uh, right on the cusp of, you know, between being an adult and a kid and hear that music and how lively it is and energetic and yet it changes moods instantly like a teenager would, mm. um, even though I think she's actually only supposed to be 12. Um, but I mean, like, you know, that that is really uh, can speak to people directly. Mm-hmm. Or when you hear um, the music when uh, Romeo, after Juliet has taken the potion to make her look like she has died, but Romeo doesn't know that, you know, and you hear the the dirge and this tragic music that represents Romeo, I think we can all connect to that, um, especially knowing the story and the story is as familiar as Romeo and Juliet. Um, so that's sort of music that I would listen to. One thing that I absolutely love is uh, the quick movement of Shostakovich's eighth string quartet. And it's when I was a teenager, this was like the heavy metal of classical music. In fact, people like that play, you know, rock guitar or metal guitar will actually play this piece on guitar because it has so much grunge in it. Um, but it is an amazing idea to sort of blow away the notion that classical music is calming or peaceful. You know, it's exactly mm-hmm. the opposite. It's actually really driven and angry and intense and quick. Um, so those are pieces that I would suggest. But I think the the clear thing is that classical music is uh, has lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years because it actually encompasses all of human emotion and so uh, and experience. And so if there is music that you don't connect to, there are plenty of other composers that you might connect to. And that's just like saying somebody like, well, I don't like lima beans, so I don't like food. You know, it's just like, because you don't, maybe not, you don't like Mozart's Anna Klein and Ox music, it doesn't mean you don't like classical music. It just means mm-hmm. that there are many, many other composers that you might connect to a little bit more. Or um, they say it takes like 40 years before you understand Brahms, or they used to tell us conductors, but that's just not true. I mean, like you can appreciate Brahms on so many different levels. And the reason why it's been around for so long is that it really is something that you can uh, um, d- dig deep into and find more, or you can just listen to without having any background to and really be um, con- and really connect to it. That was a talk with orchestra conductor Ming Luke. You can learn more about Ming at his website, mingluke.com. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. If you enjoyed this talk, I have many more talks about how people use psychology and behavior in their careers and pastimes. My website for the podcast is at behavior-podcast.com. Okay, thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. <laughs>